Throughout your life and my life, the West has unambiguously been the economic powerhouse of the world, leading the economic order, if you like. Do you see us inexorably now coming to a time where the West is fading and Asia is rising? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, on purchasing power parity, China's probably already bigger than the U.S., but even measured in U.S. dollar terms, within this decade, China will have a larger economy. Now, here's the question you got to ask yourself. The Chinese and American economies are roughly equal, but U.S. defense spending is four times as much. Who do you think in the future will have more room to ramp up their military spending? Well, China will have more room because the U.S. is already pretty much at the top of its game. <laughs> the U.S. Yeah. Uh, spends on defense more than the entire GDP of Africa. Is that done to uh, preserve world democracy or are there other forces at play? We had an interview with a guy named Parag Khanna. Uh -huh. And uh, I think he was in Singapore at the time. He's a big thinker and he had... Um, well, on the notion of Asia as the new rising powerhouse of the world, he had this to say. Sheldon, if you would. There's, again, a literal answer and maybe an intellectual answer. The, the literal answer to what or who is the future of humanity is, literal, is Asians, because the majority of the human population is Asians who live in Asia, about 5 billion of them. And the further you look in the future, Steve, as you, as you know, the world population is peaking and actually going to decline relatively soon. So the share of the human population that is Asians in Asia grows, does not recede. So we can be philosophical, and I enjoy that very much. However, the literal answer to the question, who is the future of humanity, is Asians. He, he's an interesting guy to ask that question to because he's born in India but educated in the United States and the United Kingdom. So he has this very, very global view of that question. And I guess my follow-up question for you is, the scenario as he plays it, is that something we ought to necessarily fear? Well, first of all, I don't think it's just Asians, okay? Uh, I think it's BRICS and all the countries that, won't, that want to join BRICS. And they will have not just over half of the world's population. They will have GDP much greater than that of the G7. They will control almost half of world oil reserves and over two-thirds of natural gas reserves. So they are a force to contend with. Whether we should fear that or not, we should see the world as it is because right now it's difficult to see things through the fog of war. But, uh, you know, I think we'll recognize that uh, there'll be pros and cons. And you say, well, well, what are the pros? Well, as we replace offshoring with friendshoring, we're going to discover that jobs that we thought were gone forever, those high-paying manufacturing jobs that hollowed out the middle class, guess what? They're coming back. And, you know, wages are growing at 6% now in the U.S. because you just can't close the factory and send the production back to China. Now, the other side of that is that everything that we make here that we used to get there is going to cost us a multiple of what we used to pay. And we're going to have to get used to it because for generations we've lived off the avails of cheap Chinese labor and probably everything that we consume pretty well. That's not consistent with the new world of friendshoring. If friendshoring is the way and offshoring is no longer the way, is that a world we should prefer? Well, if you are in the middle class, the hollowed out middle class, mm -hmm. this is a reprieve that you would have never gotten in globalization. Like in my last book where I questioned that, I would be called a Luddite. You know, that globalization was not only preferable, but inevitable. Well, we saw even during the economic lockdowns, those supply chains, they weren't as inevitable as people thought, mm -hmm. but that was a blip compared to what sanctions are. That was a black swan event, whereas I'd argue economic warfare is the new normal. Okay, but again, uh, uh, you know, we lost a huge, I mean, when you, talk, you talked about it in The Expendables, that book that brought you here the last time, where there's this whole chunk of North American middle-class life that essentially disappeared because of globalization. And what has happened to those people? Well, for one part, you know, many of them have decided Donald Trump is their voice because he promised to sort of bring back that kind of life. 
Should we, I, I want to go at this again, should we prefer a world where those higher paying manufacturing jobs, admittedly, which may cost us more as consumers, become a feature of our lives compared to this enormous group of people who feel they have no future. I mean, that sounds like a better way to go, doesn't it? Uh, well, it, it depends who you are. Um, but you mentioned Donald Trump brought in those tariffs. You probably recall, Steve, how people like Joe Biden and the Democrats and all the business media said, oh, those tariffs, they're, they're a ridiculous idea. They're not going to do anything. They're just going to bring back inflation. And guess what? When Joe Biden became president, not only did he not rescind a single tariff, but he doubled down and raised them. So how the goalposts have moved when our concept of normal changes. Yeah, uh, we had a nice little sparky conversation about this last time. I, my, my hunch is, and again, I don't know, I'm just, my hunch is people had fewer problems with Donald Trump's policies and more problems with the fact that he's a disgraceful horse. Well, that's, that's a separate, the po I, no, I'm interested in the yeah. policies and I'm just pointing out the inconvenient truth that the policies that's that were Gore once so, so <laughs> condemned yeah. have been adopted. And in today's world, I say, I don't think it's going to matter whether Donald Trump or Biden wins the election. I mean, it might matter for Ukraine, but sanctions and tariffs, they're here to stay in either outcome. Okay, so let me ask you, if, if Trump, uh, boy, there's a lot of handicapping going on now for what's gonna go down in November. If Donald Trump wins the election in November, what do you think changes in terms of America's relationship with China? Nothing. A lot hmm. might change with what happens in Ukraine and maybe even in Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, and NATO may be re reconsidered. But in terms of the conflict between China and the United States, Nothing will change because that conflict isn't about Taiwan. That conflict is basically Game of Thrones, you the pursuit of global power. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.